Hi, everybody. Welcome back to day one of NYSE plus the Cube Wired. We're going wall to wall coverage with our CXO series. This is Media Week, and we're super excited to have Grant Borzikas here. He's the Senior Vice President and Chief Security Officer at Cloudflare. Welcome to the well, studio here. It's great to see you. you. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. This place is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's okay. What's the difference between a CISO and a CSO? Help me understand that. <laughs> it's a good one. So CISO is SCSO, Chief Security Officer, right. which usually would imply there would be physical security in it. Chief Information Security Officer would be just information, not including physical. But I think in a lot of ways, it's, it, it's people flipping words around um, and they kind of mean the same thing. But they're coming together. Yes. Right? Okay, so your yes. role as the Chief Security Officer, of course, <clears throat> You know, we live in an industry of acronyms, which is part of the reason why I asked. But the real reason is I want to understand sort of how you spend your time. Is it mostly sort of hardening the Cloudflare infrastructure? Are your sales guys like dragging you around the country trying to get you to help them close business? How, how do you spend your time? Yeah, so I, I always think like, what's what like what did Matthew hire me to do? Why am I working at Cloudflare? Super easy. So you're right. Like, one is to protect Cloudflare. So I protect all the infrastructure for Cloudflare. So the edge network, the core networks, um, the 22% of the, the internet that comes through us, that's one. Two, then, you know, working with the product teams, trying to figure out, you know, what things we should be developing. We also have customer zero, which we run all of our products, um, which really lines up nicely with the third part, which is sitting down with customers, talking about how our products work, talking about security strategy, anything in those three lines. Um, the one thing that a customer do also want to talk with me about is I have the CloudForce One threat intelligence team underneath me. So all of the threat intelligence that Cloudflare has comes through my organization as well. So we use the term super cloud and Matthew uses the term super cloud. And we love the term, um, not only because it gets a lot of attention and it kind of, you know, a lot of people don't like it, but that actually creates conversation, so we love that as media. But more importantly, it, it connotes a distributed cloud, a distributed network. It's not just you know, a bunch of remote services up in some single data center in the cloud or even multiple data centers, it's everywhere. And so how do you think about securing such a distributed network? Yeah, I, it's a good question. I like super cloud because I think it's a it's a cool term. And, and right, understanding, one of the things I always think is, do people understand what we do or what, how the network works. When we say super cloud, why are we a super cloud? Why are we a super network? Why, some people might say we're the largest global ISP in the world. Well, we operate in 300, um, 320 cities, 120 countries, 22% of the internet comes through us. Um, and every piece of software we write is on every server in every data center. And so it's like a true platform. So when we think about the super cloud and how to protect it, what makes it a little easy in some ways, but super difficult is everything is running that's identical in all the data centers. And so that's super unique. So all of our web applications, firewalls run here in New York, they run in Chicago, they run in Sydney, and it makes this a, a very interesting way to do it. Um, to defend that is, you know, there's that there's there's great challenge in this because everybody wants to get into the network. We have so much interesting traffic, you know, huge customers that that rely on us every day to run their business comes through our network, and and I think when you think about that, it, it's this amazing job, this amazing technology. We use our own technology, that's part of customer zero. We use our own technology to defend ourselves, which is also helps make our products better, which is really cool as well. So, I want to make sure I understand it. So you're saying that your network is the, the components are homogeneous. It's mm -hmm. identical across the network, which presumably makes it easier to protect, not easy, but easier than if you had a mishmash is that fair? Yep, yep it, it does. So we know what runs on the servers. We know how the server is supposed to operate. We understand what that looks like. So while the attackers are super sophisticated, we also have a high level of sophistication with our own organization to make sure we're protected. So when you think about things like nation states attacking you um, with highly capable adversaries, very well funded, how are you, evolving the way that you're you know, dealing with zero day vulnerabilities and, and reducing risk? 
Yeah, it's a good thing. Another, using our products is one of the things. I think the other thing that we think that is very interesting from a security strategy is how do we build immutable infrastructure? This is something that I think about, you know, when you think about 20% of the internet coming through us, like that's, that, that's a lot of risk. That's a lot, huge target. You know, name the nation state, they want to get in. Name the attacker, they want to get in. Name the APT, they want to get in. And so, when we think about this is how do we build, you know, when I say immutable infrastructure, infrastructure that only thing that can change is through our pipeline and so that we can watch all the logs, we can monitor, we can drive it. That's what we're building, right? We're, we're very close to where things are today. A, immense technology footprint. The engineering team, you know, has started to build this, you know, not a year ago or two years ago, but this is something that was built from Matthew and team, you know, 10, 15 years ago when the company was in inception. Was, if you're gonna have this amount of traffic and responsibility, you have to protect it like, 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 it, is infrastructure, like it is critical infrastructure. And so we even think about ourself is we're mission critical infrastructure for the internet it is, and we have to think about that it that is way. it is critical infrastructure now you've got the network but you're constantly <coughs> Matthew and team are adding new capabilities database so what, what do you, you guys have funny names like R2 and D2 R2 right? and D1 and D1 right D1 is your first database yeah. right so <laughs> who named that I love it um, but as you add capabilities storage database uh, compute mm -hmm. um, how does that fit into that homogeneous uh, approach? Doesn't it create seams? How do you protect those seams? How does that make your job harder? Yeah, one of the, and so that's a great question. And I think what, you know, how, how this workers platform, this development platform with D1, our, our structured database, R2, our file storage, became was we needed a development platform to be able to run ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And so you want to have this very, you know, simple layer of, of application residing on a server. But it's actually very complicated when, when you try to apply it and you have thousands of developers working on it. And so we built a workers platform. And as part of workers, as you say, is it sits on top of the entire Cloudflare component. So you know, workers and D1 and R2 all sit on the same server that our web application firewall sits on or zero trust applications or um, our API protection and our API shield all sit on that same thing. And so when we think about it from protecting, you know, it's kind of, we think about it in a process standpoint of how do we make sure that our infrastructure is solid? How do we make sure our product security is solid? And then, you know, make sure that we, we do everything we can to protect the organization. So your Cloudflare is basically ubiquitous. So bad guys can use Cloudflare. They can, you know, try to do things like live off the land. Mm -hmm. You mentioned threat intelligence before. So how do you kind of balance your, your need to protect? And what are you seeing with threat intelligence in terms of bad guys actually trying to use your own infrastructure against you and your customers? So bad guys are, are very creative. <laughs> And, and they, they do use our platform yeah. and we've gotten really good. We spent a lot of time on this just lately on, you know, observing behaviors of attackers on our platform, listening to our customers, building automation to shut down, you know, phishing sites, those types of things. What it's creating is more ingenuity out of the attackers. So one of the things we're seeing just of recent is they may use our infrastructure for hosting a web page, but they're using another file storage to store the file. They're coming from, um, you know, one of the other hyperscalers to log into our systems. They're masking their entire infrastructure through three or four providers. And that's something that I think is super interesting because before you, I'll just stand it up on Cloudflare or I'll just stand it up on AWS or Google, but, you know, I'll stand up on DigitalOcean. But what they're doing is it makes one person like us easy to shut it down. And so now they're trying to distribute it. So now they're relying on our networks, you know, our, our relationship with a GitLab or a AWS or a DigitalOcean or somebody, you know, box.com that they're hosting this mass infrastructure and they're building complicated infrastructure so that it's harder to shut them down. Do you, how do you, do you or how do you get involved in supply chain and securing the supply chain? That's a big topic these days. People, you know, you think you're going to download a patch that's necessary to protect you, and it turns out to be some kind of malicious code that self forms and does all kinds of terrible things. Can you play a role in helping with that? Yeah. So I think that the first thing is we always think about our supply chain and how do we do it. Sure. Um, you know, we got to make sure that our supply chain's protected. You know, things like digitally signing and our BIOS and making sure our BIOS is is secure. You know, making sure that what we run in our environment is secure. I think that's one other component. 
Um, you know, the other thing we do, and we do a lot of services with third parties that may subscribe to an intelligence service that we can actually help say, what is that vendor doing or how are they connecting? You know, ha has a vendor been compromised and we'll help do an investigation. And so I think it's an interesting, unique component because supply chain is, is probably the toughest thing to deal with. And I always think about it as you know, the skill shortage of cybersecurity people um, is immense. And it's not the shortage of people, it's actually the skills of the people. And so, you know, every time we do business or transactions with somebody else, do they have the same security posture as I do? Um, and that's something I always think about. And so we get hired a lot or we'll talk to people about how we think about supply chain and, and drive it to, you know, helping them get some intelligence that will make them more successful. So because you are critical infrastructure, if you have a, a, an outage, that and you're pretty much ubiquitous. It's widespread, um, and it's it scales. H how do you then go back, look at the root cause, you know, capture lessons learned? I mean, it used to be, you know, in the security industry, it used to be, oh, you failed, you fired. Well, that's not the case anymore. I mean, it's just it's impossible to protect everything always. So how do you apl apply, figure out the root cause, and apply those learnings, and you know, continuously iterate? Yep, it's a good question, and, and you know, back. Um, late Q4 last year, we had an outage and we talked yep. publicly about it. So one of the things I love about Cloudflare is we talk about everything. You know, we had a security incident. Uh, we wrote a 11, 12 page blog detailing everything out that happened. And same thing on the Code Orange was what was the problem and why did it actually happen? And this was that the, uh, we didn't have enough capacity in our backup data center to take it on. Well, what did we do? Why did we think about that? What's interesting about this radical transparency that we have, it's kind of awkward. You know, I've spent most of my career in banks. And so yeah, I would yeah. never say, hey, we had a security incident. You know, they were in our environment, they did X, Y, Z. This is what they searched for. This is how they did it. It's kind of awkward because we always want to hide those things. And what I thought was was very interesting on Code Orange, which was kind of the, reliant, the, the reliability in Code Red, which was the security was, we were just radically transparent with with, with our customers and they appreciate it. And I always think, you know, every organization that I've ever been in has had an issue, had an outage, um, and, and, you know, has had a security incident that we've not really told people the truth. And I think the thing that I'm mo one of most proud here is we do tell the truth, regardless of, of what it is, that's just basic in our, our DNA and it actually helps. Because if I'm telling you the truth about everything, and I'm telling you everything, there's nothing to hide. And I was thinking, and I did this um, when I was in Australia, I did a keynote and said, has anybody had an incident? Everybody raises their hands. Right. Has anybody disclosed it? I'm the only one that had my hand up. And, and so, you know, as we go through this, the incidents and things is we want to be a role model for organizations on lessons learned. Like, well, why did that happen? How did that fail? We talked to, I probably talked to 40 CISOs during our code red of what did you do? What did they see? How did you react? We even had an organization that had a large scale breach reach out to me and say, can you help us? We want to do what you did. And I think that's kudos to kind of, you know, how we manage our environment is if there's an issue, we're going to, we're going to the first one to tell you, and we're going to tell you everything that there is, because if we don't tell you, then you're going to have to question what we are. Now, you know, we're telling you. Well, we've seen the, some of the executive orders come out. I mean, some of that, I <coughs> feel Grant is like finger waving, you know, come mm -hmm. on, do a better job. Some of it, I think is legitimate. I think the industry needs to collaborate better and, and do a better job. How, how, what's your feeling on this topic of disclosures? Do you feel like it? Should be law that you disclose these things. Yeah, I, we, you know, I, I think it's it's one that I think you it always gets the lawyers involved. Of can I disclose if I'm at a bank? Can I disclose something? Well, mm -hmm. they're already disclosing it to regulators, to the board, and so like I think we're missing a tremendous opportunity to share the lessons learned. Mm -hmm. Right, we shared all of our IOCs. We've shared all of our all, all the, the challenges we've had. You know, to build an AnyCast network you know, to have every piece of software in every server in, in 320 cities is crazy. We're going to have issues at some point, but we should be transparent. And so I think this is the one thing that we always miss is, you know, I had an incident, but I'm going to sweep on our table and pretend it didn't happen. And the next organization gets hit by it. And the next organization gets hit by it. And that's something we even see 
And our threat intelligence, you know, that we did an investigation with a very large bank that had this issue. And as we researched it, we found three other Fortune 500 having the same thing. Mm. And we said, you, you guys have to be able to talk and communicate that if they're now, we didn't disclose who they were, but we shared all of the intelligence we had because if, if we're not sharing that, we're never going to win because one organization isn't going to be able to stop an advanced attacker. Well, that's interesting because you got two sides to that equation. One is you got a highly competitive technology industry that tends not to be great at, at collaborating. It's getting better, definitely. And then you've got customers, particularly in a particular industry like finance, that they don't mm -hmm. talk. So, so do you feel like we've made progress in that regard in terms of collaboration? And and sounds like we've got more to go, but what's your advice in terms of how, to, to the industry broadly as to how we can better collaborate? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to I mean, this radical transparency. We have to be honest with what occurs. The only way we're gonna stop, you know, nation state actors is to share intelligence. We see this in the military. You know, if the army didn't share with the Navy, the Navy didn't share with the Marines, they're gonna end up with challenges. That's how the JSOC was created, you know, from an operational standpoint of being able to coordinate attacks. And the same thing here is we're, we're fighting a game, um, each one of us individually, and we're not actually learning lessons from it or, or, or sharing it. And even, you know, vendors like us that can help, we may not know that somebody had an attack because if you had an attack, then you can, we will help defend you know, the rest of the internet. And it's something we do see. Some customers do come to us and say, hey, can you stop this? We're seeing a zero day and we'll put it into our WAF rule so you can, you know, our, protect all our customers. But I think we got to be more transparent with what's going on. When when you think about things like GDPR and CCPA and you know, it states, mm -hmm. each state coming up with a different regulation, different nations, it obviously makes things more difficult. How do you deal with that and can you affect public policy in a way that so that we can have more consistent uh, laws, rules, guidelines? Yeah, I, I think the hardest thing, that's great, the bell. I love it, oh, the love bell, the bell ring. Yeah, for that's you. That's better, hey, good <laughs> yeah. job, everybody. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, the, one of the biggest problems that we face is complexity. Yeah. Um, and that could be, we, you know, force technology ch choices. I worked in an organization when I came in, there were six web application firewalls, six different kinds. Well, that's not gonna help. And so now think about the states, and if you're a global organization, you, you know, you could have Australia rules, Singapore rules, US, you know, France, you know, UK, and how do you actually build a program that's cohesive? You're spending more time trying to comply versus be secure. And I think it's one that if we could get a common set of controls, you know, this is why a lot of people, you know, under the executive order have, have, have said, you know, adopt NIST and how do you yep. do NIST? But I think it's, you know, we need more general guidance with where we're going to do, because um, I think it'll be helpful because to comply with this, this, and this, you know, and there may be competing control issues. Well, how do I do this when they want to do that? So it's the opposite. And I think those are, are things that can really cause complexity, which causes breaches. How, how'd you get into this business? Mm -hmm. And when you were a kid, did you have like a superhero that you sort of modeled after or to protect the world? I was a baseball guy. Yeah, um, me too. I went to college on a baseball scholarship. I didn't. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, after I kind of I got burned out and long story, my, I said, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to be. So my mom said I should be an accountant and you should always listen to your mom. There so I became go. an accountant. Okay. Um, and started my accounting degree, decided I hated it, uh, but I started taking some programming courses in college. And my dad was around computers and we used to play computers when we were little. And so I started coding C++ in college. Um, I got hired as an, because I'm still listening to my mom, you know, got a job with Arthur Anderson and um, as an accountant and just hated it. And they said, we're gonna start this, they call it computer risk management. And I'm like, kind of technology, security, audit before any of this was cool and I, was probably one of the 50, first 50 people in Anderson's practice and, and have done this since the late 90s. Oh, very cool. Were you a catcher? Not first base. First base, me first too. Base, third base, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Lefty or righty? <laughs> righty. That's good. righty. I can always hit. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It was such a pleasure having you on. Pleasure. I really appreciate you making some time for us. Awesome. Thank you very All much. Right. Yeah. Great. And keep it right there. We got more content. This is wall to wall coverage. The Cube plus NYSE Wired, our CXO series is Media Week. I'm Dave Vellante. Keep it right there.